Welcome to the Brain Health Revolution podcast with your hosts, Aisha and Dean Sherzai. Today, we're very excited to be here with you all. The subject of the conversation is a revolutionary, empowering approach to preventive medicine. And this is something that Dean and I have been very passionate about. Our community work is based on this, and we're going to explore this. I can't wait to dive in, Dean. I know this is uh, extremely important to us because we think that uh, there's a lot of work that have been done in fields of lifestyle medicine, preventive medicine, and all the other versions of it, you know, functional medicine and integrative medicine and complementary medicine and alternative medicine, and the names go on and on and on. Some valid, some not so valid, but there's a lot of information that we have now about prevention and prevention of diseases. It's no longer a fringe concept. When lifestyle medicine is science and consensus driven, it can be an incredibly powerful source of information, but it's never enough. And often it leaves people disempowered mm -hmm. as change is difficult. And all we have done by volleying and lobbying information at people, even correct information, we overwhelm them without any tools necessary to bring about change in their life. We see this repeatedly. That's why while working on the science of lifestyle, we have focused even more on how behavior change can be brought into individual lives mm -hmm. and more importantly at community level lives mm -hmm. because that's where you make significant public health difference. But nobody's focusing on the translation. How do we empower communities? Right. And that's why we fail over and over and over again. And today we'll talk a little bit about the failures and the reason for the failures. And more importantly, this is where the positive aspect comes in. The, the incredible powerful tools we have now, especially with neuroscience coming into the realm of individual empowerment and leadership, as well as at the community level, where communities are given the tools to completely change their healthcare system on their own. Yeah, absolutely. I want to make sure that everybody understands that we are not the type of doctors, preventive doctors and lifestyle doctors, where we negate medicine. Oh, negate no. is in, medicine is incredibly needed helpful it's been a revolution but what we are hoping is that there's greater focus put on prevention as well which there is no shortage of evidence uh, for it's just that it's pretty scattered and it really hasn't been brought to the front and um, i'm really excited to talk about this because there are very few individuals who try to highlight where we actually go wrong as far as process improvement is concerned. Correct. I think there is plenty of positive information out there as far as lifestyle intervention and preventive medicine is concerned. But focusing on points of failure in healthcare is incredibly important because that's where we learn. Exactly, exactly. So let's talk about the failures a bit. Okay. <clears throat> lifestyle medicine when looked at in a comprehensive way and in, over time, has failed repeatedly. Whether it was the diet of the day or the food program of the day or the exercise plan of the day, we're talking failure rates as high as 85% across the board. And we're not talking about drugs. We're talking about food. We're talking about exercise. So um, there's some, let's pick one of those, mm -hmm. weight, weight loss for that matter. Right. In 1990, the number of people that were considered obese in the United States was around 11%. Mm -hmm. Or three states were considered obese. Now, after 30 years or so of information and science and talking heads and internet and social media and everything else, you would think with this one measure, although that's not something we focus on anyway, the weight component, we focus on lifestyle, we have not only failed, we have failed massively. Now we have 31 to 33% of the population that are in obese range. And, and the obesity part aside, diabetes is ramping up and climbing exponentially. Heart disease, cognitive diseases, dementia, and almost all of it has to do with lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Not because of aging. Right. Because in fact, our aging parameters have not changed. Right. We are not living healthy. And so our approaches have been wrong. The information is, is there. The information is a little noisy because different people say different things to, at some points. But in general, people know not to eat processed food, mm -hmm. to yeah. reduce salt. If you're going to disagree on some other things, at least salt we agree on. And sugar. Actually. And sugar yeah. most everybody agrees on. 
Yeah, the fat component, and we'll speak about why, that's a little bit of a controversy. But, but everybody agrees on sugar, salt, mm-hmm. and the quantity of food. Agreed. Yet, none of that has changed. Yeah. We're eating more. We're eating more salt. We're eating more sugar. And yet, we are less and less healthy every single day. Absolutely. And, and the reason is because change is hard. Change is bewilderingly hard. Mm-hmm. And because change is somewhere that you have not been. Mm-hmm. Change is something you're not familiar with. Change is 360 degrees of uncertainty, of the unknown. Even if somebody shows it to you in a picture or in a vision, it's not something that you have actually felt, sensed, experienced. It is an imaginary thing that's an unknown. And that's scary. And that's such a profound concept <clears throat> because I think our brain always tries to seek patterns and patterns are created when something is repeated over and over again so when you're surrounded by something that's the same and remains the same those patterns are deep those connections are ingrained any small change from that deep pattern brings out fear brings out you know, not not being comfortable and declining that. So it's as it's as if you're you're you just kind of press the brakes whenever there is a small little change that you're surrounded with. Absolutely, absolutely. And then on top of that, change is complex. Mm. You know, it's not do this alone. It's doing this in the absence of this other thing, in the context of this environment, in the presence of these people, and in the over time in a period where you have to do it in at work, you know, at home, in the environment, the communities, and with friends, it's complex. Right. It's incredibly. And then I'm not even adding the socioeconomic component of it. I'm not even adding the information as far as where do I get this particular thing. It's complex. So it's the path less traveled that we try to avoid. The the path that's worn, it's flat. We've walked on that path so much that the stones have turned into sand. It's flat. Yet the other paths seem quite tenuous, quite rocky, and uncomfortable. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to uh, pursue. Now, the other thing that happens is the, that when we take on certain behaviors very early in life, they cut grooves almost I, I would I don't want to say that it's exactly this it's almost like they are cutting grooves into the fabric into the structure of your brain mm-hmm. but imagine there is a wall of snow on two sides there's a road going through it well that road uh, unless there was a plow and and you can use whatever metaphor you want has plowed through this wall of snow and changing paths becomes difficult mm-hmm. The wall of snow on the two sides will stop you from changing direction. Nobody wants to walk into the snow to create new paths. uh, You just keep on following the one that has been created for you. Because you can't even see beyond that wall. Mm. That wall was laid down so early that you can't see beyond it. I like that analogy. Yeah. And and then on top of that, the perpetual battle of the limbic brain and the frontal lobe or prefrontal cortex. The thinking brain, the processing brain, the planning brain, and the emotional brain. And the emotional brain is the older brain. Now, we take so much pride in the size of our brain, we actually don't have the biggest brain in the world. Yeah. We, we remember when we were at UCSD, uh, there was this pathologist, a uh, very well-known pathologist that used to make all kinds of films out of layers of, of uh, tissue, brain tissues. Right. And he had an elephant brain and a gorilla brain. All. Well, elephant brains are huge, way bigger than ours. And whale brains, we're talking eight to ten times bigger than our brain. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they don't have less neurons. They have quite a few neurons. But the one part that's different is the frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex, which is the thinking, processing, problem solving, list making, negating brain. That amazing part of the brain is powerful. Mm-hmm. But guess what? It's not as powerful as, as the old ingrained, uh, you know, paleolithic the only place where paleolithic fits in is here the The paleolithic limbic brain which is small especially the amygdala that little core that's the size of the tip of your thumb it is powerful Mm -hmm. when it releases it's a leviathan it's almost like the uh, the the hulk is coming through bruce banner is it yeah yes it's coming through and and that you don't and you can control it by knowing what are the triggers and what to do. But it's powerful. 
So right. this battle that I described, it's a little scary. I don't want to overwhelm you. I don't want you to think that's not, uh, you know, it's unsurmountable. It's not, you know, the wall of snow, the uh, path um, that, that's uh, tr uh, treacherous, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the complexity, the fear of the unknown, all of those true, but it is completely, you know, overcomable. Right. We can overcome it. We can win it. We can win this important battle. And it is critical that we win it. In fact, we exist because of that change. Right. Mm -hmm. The very thing that makes us different from every other animal in, in a significant way is our ability to change during our life, mm -hmm. not as a consequence of death, but during our life. Thoughtful change. Thoughtful change. Mm -hmm. Yes, not reflexive change, because that's not thought. Right. Thoughtful change is what makes us powerful, <laughs> that makes us who we are. And I think the most important paradigm, imperative that we have as human beings is to change. Mm -hmm. Imagine if people 5,000 years ago would say, oh, no, this is it. We are here. We now have the wheel and we, we can make some metal and, and we can make fire. And my goodness, that's it. We got everything. We, there's no need for more change. And as far as ethics and morals and, and behavior and, and technology and environmental control, we got it. Well, we would have never changed. And what a loss. I know that some people in the audience would say, oh, we need to go back. Nope, not us. So if you're the kind that thinks that we need to go back to the Paleolithic time, I am not one of them. We have incredible potential yeah. for good, for unity, for power, for, for, for creating a different world of order and beauty. Uh, I, I should be careful with those words because these are not political words. These are human words. These are words that are going to give us humans. In fact, whatever your perspective, that's the power that we've been given to bring about change. Right. So <clears throat> change is ours to have. But first, we have to take the battle in a very systematic way. Understand our challenges specifically and measurably, and then take on the battle. Right. Now, there are a couple of things, a few things that I want to talk about, because these terms or <laughs> you and I who have dealt with this on a day-to-day -day basis uh, when we were doing research at U uh, NIH or UCSD, these were the words that we worked with and we, we actually worked with them at the human level. Yeah, well, these are the things that we're trained in. Trained like being in, a neurologist exactly. and a scientist, you actually you know, talk about the anatomy of the different parts of the brain and how it functions. And so I know you're, <clears throat> you're actually referring to neurobabble and these are terminologies that are used by just, you know, random people just to, you know, make people feel like they understand something about neuroscience and they're used erroneously mostly. So I'm glad that you actually chose to explore this. Yeah, and they're used even by some neuroscientists to separate themselves. Actually, then it turns out to be highlighting them as far as their knowledge, but it's disempowering to everybody else. Right. Let's give the power back to the people. <laughs> that sounds again weird, but it's not. It's 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 empowerment. Yes. It's empowerment. So some of those words are the limbic hypothalamic pituitary axis and mm -hmm. the autonomic system. Dopamine. Oh my goodness! How many people talk about dopamine? Right. I've actually seen lawyers talk about dopamine mm -hmm. and and the legal aspects of dopamine. <laughs> actually, there is such a thing. But serotonin, the prefrontal cortex, and creating habits. Mm -hmm. Habit books. How many habit books have we seen? Quite a few, actually. They're copies of each other. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and literally copies. It depends on who had the better marketing. <laughs> because we, you and I have been looking at the habit books. Literally five habit books that are identical in every way. The last one just did a very good job of marketing it. Sure. And we know, yeah. So let's talk about these five, uh, sorry, six concepts, which are important to kind of d disconnect. Uh, disentangle, and then give it to the individual to kind of bring into their lives. Agreed. Um, at first, I'll go into describing some of these. So the limbic system is the emotional brain. It's where the interpretation, the understanding, the experiencing of the emotions takes place. It's in the lateral aspect of the brain or in the middle part of the lateral aspect. And it's it's actually pretty small in size. It's, it's a band that starts in the amygdala and goes around and actually connects to a lot of different parts of the brain. And it is incredibly powerful because how we interpret our emotions or how we experience our environment emotionally actually ends up creating certain type of neurotransmitters that are 
and sending information to the hypothalamus, which is the command central. Right. And then hypothalamus then sends information to this little structure called the pituitary, which is the size of your tip of your pinky. That little pituitary. It's the master gland. Master gland. Mm -hmm. oh, um, so many hormones come out of that, yeah. from growth hormone to thyroid to sexual hormones, such as, uh, uh, control of FSLH and FSH, and to um, every structure that that is hormone driven is affected by it. Agreed. Yep. Including through uh, adrenal system and other systems, even our immune system. That's why how our uh, bones are uh, developing, how we are sexually experiencing our, 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 our sexual lives, mm -hmm. be it through FSH and LH and testosterone, how we're growing through growth hormone, mm -hmm. uh, the thyroid hormone, which involves, is, which is involved in everything, right. including insulin and everything else, is controlled by this pituitary. So that emotion from moment to moment, from, from hour to hour, affects ultimately every system. Let's not forget oxytocin. Oh my goodness! That is secreted by the pituitary yes. gland, and you know the, it's been given the several different names of the hormone of love and affection, <clears throat> but just oxytocin, and we're learning so much about it, um, about its effect on our thinking process, about our feelings, and how it affects every system. Correct, absolutely. The oxytocin and vasopressin, the, which is a constrictor and a fluid controller, is actually in the posterior pituitary. So. So all this is controlled by, by this amazing, amazing um, uh, system. And by the way, the reason we're describing it is just to give you kind of, kind of some control over this. How we interpret, how we experience the world emotionally from moment to moment affects all of that. Right. So I love this <clears throat> fact. So what you're saying and what we're saying is that the limbic system, your emotional old brain how it feels and how it you know tries to make an understanding of the environment can actually affect how your brain processes and how your hormones are created and secreted absolutely and as a result of that the rest of your body gets affected by it too. and we have control over that amazing and so and we don't talk about this the fact that we have to a great extent quite a bit of control over it mm -hmm. and uh, just as a clue the language we occupy in our mind determines that. Mm. So we'll get to that. The second system is the what's called the autonomic system, right? Autonomic system is the uh, autopilot system. Um, it's the system that, that controls your body's reaction to the environment for, from moment to moment. Uh, and it's a survival and thriving system that doesn't require your brain to a great extent. In fact, its centers are outside of the brain for the, for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. So the sympathetic system, a euphemism for it is the fight or flight system, mm -hmm. right? And then the parasympathetic system is called the rest, the restore, reproduce system. Rest and digest is what I've rest heard. Rest and digest is another one, mm -hmm. yes. The sympathetic system is more powerful because your survival is more important from moment to moment than you thriving. Right. Um, and so... That system is about whatever needs to be done immediately to, for you to survive. So let's think of it that way. Um, anything that, whenever there's a threat, be it a physical threat, environmental threat, or emotional threat, it, it turns on certain systems rapidly to make you survive. What would make you survive? Bring blood from periphery to center. Because mm -hmm. if you lose your arm, you can still live. But if you lose blood supply, blood flow to your heart or brain, you're dead or you're permanently damaged. You're not going to be able to reproduce. Mm. Um, if you are under attack, your reproduction is not as important. Right. All resources away from reproduction. So oh. drive and, 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 and menstrual cycles and, and testosterone, all of those are diminished. Oh, great. Um, the same thing with uh, bones. You don't need to build bones right now. Let's focus on survival. You don't need immunity right now. Whatever True. resources it's using to, to focus it on survival. Right. Your heart rate starts going faster. Your pupils constrict to see better. Your brain becomes a very <laughs> emergency-driven brain. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care about logic. It just cares about hitting and running mm. or just running right. for the most part. Right. So It's a survival mode. Survival mode. Your think, lungs expand. Your lungs, so, so think about that. Yeah. 
you can actually kind of deduce by yourself what systems would not be needed during an emergency and you got it right. Whatever you thought, you got it right. All those systems are diminished. Right. Agreed. The parasympathetic system, the opposite. Now, the sympathetic system was, was obviously needed in a, in a world where we had to survive from moment to moment. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter if we lost an arm as long as we survived the attack so that we could then reproduce. It didn't matter that for the moment, you know, my, my, uh, my um, reproductive system was not on its full gear. Yeah. But, 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 uh, so, but what if that persists? And it persists because up to the 20th century and 21st century, or actually what they say is, I'm not going to get too much into the wonkiness of language, because language is consciousness. Mm. As our language developed further, we transferred all those stressors and started carrying it with us, almost like a weight on our back, but it's actually in our language centers and, and our memories, right. with our language. Mm -hmm. So when we, we were able to understand things, create language, create stories, we actually carried stress with us. So now in the 21st century, we have stress with us constantly. Right. So that fight or flight system, if not in full blown mode, it is in a simmering mode throughout. I, I and if you have an anxiety state, agree. even more so. We're seeing, well, most of the chronic um, diseases that people are experiencing has a very heavy uh, footing in that chronic stress paradigm. Does. Where all of these unnecessary <clears throat> hormones that are su supposed to protect you under dire of the direst of conditions are continuously being activated yes. over and over again. So it's uh, we're experiencing more wear and tear due to these stressors than actual wear and tear that is associated with the process of living. Absolutely. I mean, for the last 20 years, my work, I'm a neurobehaviorist, has been on, on, on behavior and for a great part of it, I've been looking at the cortex and the thinking brain, and, and now I'm realizing that it's just as important to focus on this sub subconscious process mm -hmm. of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system, yeah. because we have control over it as well. And we'll get to that, because a clue to that is biofeedback is a clue to that. Right. When you try to slow your heart rate, it's not for the heart rate. It's because it actually makes you feel as if, you're calmer. When you're controlling your breath, when you're doing breathing exercises, just do two deep breaths. It, is, it has a profound calming effect. And that calming effect actually fools your brain saying, that, oh, I'm in a sympathetic, parasympathetic state. I'm going to calm down. And actually can, over time, significantly affect your mood and the systems that follow from that. Talk about tricking your brain. It is completely a trickery of the brain. Dopamine. Dopamine is an interesting neurotransmitter. Yeah. Now, one clue for it to it is that it, it has multiple functions, but two major functions is movement and motivation. Right. Or anticipation. And for two years, I worked on Parkinson's and everything you can think of as far as treatments and um, uh, stimulators, electrical stimulators into the brain and, and, and um, uh, stem cells in the brain. And when I was at National Institutes of Health, and uh, you could see the interrelationship between motivation and even uh, addiction right. and movement. So when you gave a person the dopamine agonist or dopaminergic medications that increased dopamine, you saw behavioral changes as well, mm. including addictive behaviors and other as well. So anticipation is, is a major part of uh, dopamine, mm -hmm. um, uh, creating expectations and even the direction towards feeling good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to preface by saying directions. I'm simplifying here. And, and that's incredibly powerful to create these mini anticipations, right. mini directional anticipations, because that creates mini bursts of happiness. I like that. Joy. These little quanta of, of popping joy. Have you ever popped those little um, bubbles? They're uh, the, the, the they're packing. a trend now. Yes, they oh. actually have them. They have these silicon little, uh, almost like those pill packs. Yes, you just basically pop it in and pop it out, pop it in and pop it out, and it's supposed to de-stress you. Well, I tell you, uh, <laughs> they're uh, everywhere. To some extent, it's true, but you you can't 
overstimulate the dopamine system as well. And there's a whole talk on that, that the fact that we're overstimulating the dopamine mm. system and it's not losing, it's losing its effect. I see. It's a closed system. You can't just continuously stimulate it. Right. So you have to manage, you have to manage your dopamine process. Right. So, so dopamine is that. And there are other things that dopamine does, uh, learning, mood, lactation. Uh, in fact, it's involved in sleep and attention and memory as well. But movement and anticipation and, and feeling of reward and, and things of that nature and motivation are, are central to it. So um, then we have serotonin, mm -hmm. another one. I mean, yeah. uh, the, this people have become aware of serotonin. Um, for a few years now with the, all these drugs like Prozac and Zoloft and all these, which are what they call SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Selective, uh, serotonin, selective re serotonin reuptake yeah. inhibitors. Um, and what happens is that it increases the amount of serotonin. Yeah. And, and uh, now as a second wave, now we're beginning to learn about serotonin again with GI stuff because there's more serotonin created outside of the uh, brain than inside. It's, it's not the same thing. It doesn't do the same work. Yeah. It's perfectly, but still, we're becoming familiar with serotonin. Agreed, agreed. But serotonin has many functions. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into that. Sexuality and, and blood clotting and, and wound healing and, and nausea and, and different amounts. Mood and sleep, of and, course. Yeah, but the main ones are mood, sleep, mm -hmm. happiness. And I threw in, I like the word joy, and joy as well. It's the big ship of emotion. Mm -hmm. It's not the little, little waves. It's the big... You know, the a, tanker? A tanker. It's the yeah, ocean liner. The ocean of emotions. liner. Okay. And and there's a clue there. You can change the direction of the ocean liner as well. And we'll get to that at the end. But it and, and we will have a complete separate talk on how depression and anxiety and all of those can be managed. But it is an ocean liner of emotions. Right. And and we have control both over the ocean liner and the ocean. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful so, stated. Um then the last word is the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. the brain, the main brain. Well, I like the language centers as well, the word in Kisenberg, but the prefrontal cortex is the processing, planning, problem solving, list making, uh, and, and, and negating, uh, you know, the dangerous uh, brain. And, and that's the part of the brain that's the newest member to the family. Mm -hmm. It has incredible powers. It gives us our ability to evolve in life, mm -hmm. to make changes in life. To make um, changes, not just in life, but from moment to moment. That's remarkable power. Very few animals have the capacity to gather data and immediately make changes and memorize that so that it doesn't happen again. And also to see the pattern of how it's going to be so it, it, that, that particular path in the future. So planning for the future or foreseeing the future, not in a magical way, but essentially translating a specific pattern into seeing how it evolves in the future is also a function of the prefrontal lobe, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, uh, um, and, and sadly, it's also the part of the brain that shrinks the fastest as we age. That's correct. And under certain circumstances, like sleep or lack thereof, it's affected the most. Mm -hmm. So so let's be aware of that. So change requires awareness of all of these systems. Mm -hmm. Don't be overwhelmed. You don't have to take a class. You're not going to be tested on this. There's not going to be a quiz. <laughs> Maybe a, a short quiz. No, I'm just kidding. There's no quiz. But be aware of it. When people throw things at you, make sure that we figure out how to inculcate, incorporate these things in a systematic way according to your resources, your you know, your capacity, where you are in your journey. Mm -hmm incorporate these things into your life um be aware of the power of the limbic system yeah. uh, how emotions actually control even our our thinking brain the autonomic system where your heart starts beating fast you don't have to interpret it as anxiety you can say anticipation some mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite um, uh, things i saw was when um uh, for those of you who are sports fans michael jordan the same emotion that would make somebody else nervous the yeah. hand sweating the heart beating fast the breath becoming faster, the pupils constricting. There's this sense of a little disease, mm -hmm. this ease. Uh, somebody, majority of people would interpret that as anxiety, fear. Their vision would close. Their thinking would close. Their possibilities would close. Their shooting would, would narrow. <laughs> their hands would shake. Somebody who's used to it has it interpreted accidentally or thoughtfully early enough or even later in life, but then repeated it so it becomes part of them. That is perceived to them as anticipation, right. challenge, 
And this is where I can, I can, I, even if I fail, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to improve and, and get better. So the interpretation matters. Mm -hmm. So by being aware of the autonomic system going off, you set into place the control systems that can override it, right? Take control of it. The uh, dopamine uh, creates anticipation. We always say, forget about, um, um, you know, lifestyle in the general sense. One little behavior that you are measurably changing and then you're checking off. Right. That checking off on a piece of paper or clicking on a, on a pad is incredibly powerful in giving you that, that dopamine burst. Right. Yeah. And, and the effect of all these little bursts, these little waves, these tugboats of dopamine and, and directional action, changing the ocean and the ocean liner of serotonin. <laughs> I which like is the long-term emotions, long-term anxiety, long-term depression, long-term mood, long-term joy, power, empowerment, whatever you want to call it, mamba mentality for those who are into the uh, uh, sports vernacular. All of that is this ocean liner that you create. Your frontal lobe is your thinking brain, but it is a system at your disposal. Mm -hmm. There's a clue there. System. Right. Process at your disposal. Not 10,000 steps repeated, five steps repeated, then evaluated, thought about, process improved, resourced, impediments removed, then repeated again with those new skin conditions. Then Beautiful. five times repeated, then the same thing. That's your frontal lobe that we have control over. Why would you surrender that thinking brain to 10,000 steps? True. Let's say that and that's those 10,000 <laughs> steps, five are correct, but two are incorrect. So 10,000 mm -hmm. steps, you did five correct and two incorrect. What if you do, you know, 10 steps, reassess, make it six correct, one off, then repeat, and then recorrect. So that process is in the frontal lobe. There it is. Those terms are now in your control. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope that you listen to this podcast a couple of times <laughs> and we'll provide it in different ways in small quanta, small, right. and, but, but it is critical. And we've done this in communities and, and throughout, in fact, in our own community that we've created, which is the Neuro Academy, um, for those, this is a, a, a unabashed uh, advertisement, <laughs> uh, neuroacademy.com. Yes. We're actually taking entire communities who have a community there, they have coaches, we have a weekly live sessions with us, either That's a correct. cooking session or, yeah. or a coaching session, where a team actually takes people, their conversations on a regular basis, how to correct things. That's the Q&As that come in, the coaching yeah. sessions. Without that, they've seen nothing works that well. In Neuro Academy, what we've done, and I'm really proud of this, team, yeah. is the reiteration of these important <clears throat> behavioral steps towards success. We don't shy away from telling people what the optimal is. Yes. What the optimal is as far as diet, exercise, stress management, sleep, and optimizing one's cognitive activity. The optimal is the optimal. But how do you get from point A to that optimal, Z, is is not a straight path. No. And it is completely different for each and every individual. And these little nudges that you were talking about is so important to be done in a compassionate, loving environment. And data-driven. And data, oh, obviously. That's the yes. most important thing because there's a lot of noise out there. Yes. Um, the one word that keeps bothering me is hacking. Yes. So I don't think you can hack your way no, towards no. a you know better brain. Or with a vitamin or some vitamin concoction that's going to fill some holes. No way. None of that. Mm -hmm. It's a compassionate, data-driven system of people together um, uh, uh, nudging each other towards improvement. Absolutely. And we've done it in community after community. We won the National Academy of Medicine Award for this. Yes, I know. I'm a bit unabashed with the question. <laughs> and, and other awards, and we're proud of that. So, so, does it, so if anybody's interested, visit neuroacademy.com to take a look at this wonderful community, and um, as well as evidence-based information courses on all of the elements of lifestyle for better brain health. Yes, absolutely. So, and then, but I want to start going forward with this idea that shift is possible, right. change is possible, but it's important that we do it in a systematic, you know, specific, measurable. You've heard about SMART goals, but that's not enough. But that's a good start. S SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, relevant to the higher goal that you're going to set. We, we, we do these sessions with, with our groups 
which is purpose finding and, and goal setting and, and systems creating and identity creation and culture propagation, mm -hmm. multiple layers that others have not done, and especially at the neuroscientific perspective, they right. haven't done it. So we're very proud of that. And then we want people to own it. Agreed. We want communities to own it. Because if we've changed a community to be 10% better, healthier, not better, healthier, we have reduced stroke by 10%. Absolutely. Which is way more than anything out there. And dementia and, and heart disease and so on and so forth. So we're proud that our system, although it's called Neuroacademy, we say that if you've taken care of the brain, you've taken care of all health. Because in brain, you've taken care of heart. All those, those things are similar. But when it comes to brain... There are some other elements that are not considered in, in other fields, mm. such as emotions and anxiety, which I just spoke to and touched about. And we have, by the way, in Neuroacademy, we have courses on anxiety that, that are coming in a couple of months. We have a complete eight-hour course on neuro right now, an entire course with certification on nutrition and coaching, neuro coaching to be specific. But let's not forget T for time bound. T for time bound. It's <laughs> in the critical. smart. Yeah, because, yes. because um, different things require a different amount of time to change as far as behavior is concerned. Agreed. You're not going to get rid of sugar in 21 days. That's It's going to take true. longer. Take it from my personal experience and myself. Went through sugar it myself. Sugar takes longer. For me, it was, you know, uh, processed meat and processed uh, foods that took longer. And uh, the ho-hos. I had to find an alternative. I always found those disgusting. I never had well, them. We're, well, I'm not a big judge. All right, I'm not, a, I'm not judging you. A little but... bit of judgment. That's <laughs> no, I feel judged. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it, it, they are disgusting in retrospect. Because right. once you change your taste, right. it, it becomes different, doesn't but I, it? But I have to say, I mean, you know, it feels good to be in a position where you're not craving sugar, but it's a constant battle. I mean, to, to even, some extent. E even exposure to it a little bit, or for example, you know, being exposed to it and seeing other people eating it. You, we all need that <clears throat> protective, comfortable uh, environment where we're reminded of the bigger purpose the community. of why we're doing it, the why. Absolutely. The why, yes. I absolutely love that. So let's get back to the point of what makes us most human. To change is to be human. Beautiful. We're not the fastest organism, so, you know, we're not the one that can jump the highest. Uh, we're not the strongest. We're not the hairiest, although sometimes, um, yeah. That's a good thing. That's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're not, um, in any way, we're not superior. Um, it's not even a bad matter of superiority. We're not uh, uh, very uniquely different from other animals in that. But one thing that we're different in is our frontal lobe mm -hmm. and our brain, our empathic brain, empathy comes from the thinking brain. Right. And our processing, problem-solving, planning brain. Mm -hmm. Those are what makes us human, and the two are give us the ability to change. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to change. What are we changing? Right. We're changing three things. Thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. I had a conversation with my daughter just the other night. Um, um, and she was saying that these emotions come over me and I want to change. And I was like, okay, emotions are difficult to change mm -hmm. because they don't have a shape. They don't have a handle. They're, they don't have a, something to hold on to. Yes. Sometimes, and sometimes they do. Sometimes you can actually calm yourself. But, but sometimes what you do is you change behavior and thoughts and that leads to emotions okay. over time. Yeah. And that's where the clue is. So we, we, we want to do that. Um, and changing old habits are tough because they were laid down decades earlier. They're calcified. Calcified. They, they were laid They're down. How were they laid down? So there's a there's a um, mechanism in change and, and habits. Habits are repetitive behaviors, thoughts, or emotions mm -hmm. that, that are um, automatic. Mm -hmm. People say that 40%, I saw an article in Duke University, 40% of our behaviors are habits. Others say 60. I say 90 or more is habits. Mm. Even our Thoughts and political thoughts are habits. We don't think about them. There are macro programs for computer geeks out there. Macro programs that are laid down, and as soon as you come to this topic, that macro program comes on. As right. soon as this topic, as soon as this feeling, this thought, these emotions come on in, in an automatic way. So these, and so, how were they created in the first place? Stimulus or trigger, behavior, response. Or reward. Mm -hmm. So that had to be rewarded some way. Yeah. It was rewarded either by food, or that's where the dysfunctional eating comes in. Mm. 
rewarded by, by praise, rewarded by physical things, or rewarded most often by that powerful sympathetic system. Right. Fight or flight. We were threatened emotionally, psychologically, physically. We did a behavior that was not the most functional behavior. We ran away, ran away or punched back or hit back. I've never punched back, but let's say we pushed back yeah. or yelled back or did a curse that felt so viscerally good. Yeah, yeah. But did it do anything to truly change the behavior or the environment, the situation? No. It just pushed the situation back. Right. That was the reward. Yeah. yeah. The, the stimulus of the fight or flight was lowered. Mm -hmm. The sympathetic drive was lowered because the threat was averted. Mm -hmm. But it was averted in a dysfunctional way. Yeah. It was never done in a way where actually that behavior in the middle was functional toward the higher outcome of life, growth, personality. I, I tell my kids, every time you solve a problem with your sibling or us or somebody, you're not just solving the problem functionally for that moment. Mm -hmm. You're laying down the habit pathway. You remember those walls of snow? You're creating new pathways of snow, but now not dysfunctionally, but through willing, willing it into something meaningful, purposeful, and connected to higher purposes. How beautiful. That's the whole point yeah. of creating habits positively and systematically. As it happens, bad habits are laid down and then they're linked to each other. Yes. Because one bad habit of smoking is connected to a habit of drinking. And then the habit of that is to stress. And whenever there is stress, we eat the you know, bad food. Right. And then because you can't be, uh, you, those bad habits require bad friends that love the bad habits. Then you get other bad friends, or not bad friends, but friends who have bad habits who add on further habits. Agreed, yes. So habits are usually connected to each other. Yes. Good habits with good habits and bad habits with bad habits. And that's not a judgment statement. That's just how they're piled onto each other. Agreed. One set of habits are driven by sympathetic uh, um, drives being um, quenched and calmed down. Another is driven by parasympathetic or frontal lobe systems that are driven by purpose, meaning, and growth. Mm -hmm. And so let's start resetting our patterns. Um, change, again, as I said, is difficult, yeah. somewhat tenuous at times. Very. Sometimes there's failure with it, so expect the failure. I always tell people everything else that's done repetitively is management. Leadership is comfort with discomfort, yeah. but meaningful discomfort, not just you know jumping off a building, but you're going <laughs> to do public speaking and you never liked it. You plan, you strategize, you make sure that you increase the chances of success, but then even if you fail, you say, oh, that okay, that's okay. So there are, it's going to be fraught with some failures, but if done strategically and repeatedly in that, with a direction, it's going to build this new pathway. I think being comfortable with discomfort in itself is a habit too. Yes. And, you know, you're, you're creating a habit for a habit that will help you become a better version of yourself. Yeah. What is the term? I, I, the number one thing I tell our kids and we tell our kids is strategic risk taking. Right. Strategic discomfort. Strategic challenge, strategic change. Yes, it should be uncomfortable, but it should be strategic, meaning it is done in a way that's towards a purpose and, and that, that's going to make you better, make you feel better, create calmer inner states, create more powerful inner states, and more importantly, that you're going to be able to help others. And, and, and uh, service is everything for us. I'm getting excited because, well, this is a digression and hopefully we'll have a conversation about that. But how important <clears throat> it is that we tell our children that it's okay to fail and actually creating very comfortable environments for them to fail yes. indeed so that they could experience that and be okay with it and make more mistakes because that will be one of the most powerful things they will carry with them as adults. If they're not taking chances to change, strategic chances, not unnecessary, unsafe ones. If they're not taking strategic uh, with some safety in mind, uh, but with the idea of failure in it, there's no change. Agreed. And look at the disadvantage a person is left with compared to somebody else who's comfortable with change on a daily basis, mm -hmm. minute by minute basis versus somebody who's scared. And by the way, there are a huge percentage of population is so counter change. Oh, Absolutely. They have created language that mitigates, pushes back against change. And 
that creates this patterns of anxiety that build on anxiety and build on anxiety. So it is critical that we tell our kids how to fail well. Yes. How to fail well. So if you're ready, um, it requires a commitment. Mm -hmm. It requires data-driven approach. And hopefully we in our community and with us, we do that as well. With, uh, you, you're part of our family. And it requires a little bit of a comprehensive approach. Blueberries are great, but by themselves, they're not going to do anything. Oh, don't say that. Not, I mean, you can't <laughs> love eat the fried chickens five times a day and then eat blueberries and think that's going to make a huge difference. Obviously. It's got to be comprehensive. There's got to be exercise in it. How many times we have hear people, oh, I eat well, by the way, only 0.4% of Americans by American Heart Association standards eat well. So Which is everybody, not that great anyway. Not great, yeah. So I eat well. And no, my aunt ate well and they still got this certain disease. Well, oh. even if that's the case, none of us have been exercising well, eating well, stress managing well sleeping well, mm -hmm. mentally active towards our purpose, yeah. not drinking or, uh, not, or not drinking significantly, Agreed. not smoking, and all of that stuff, very few. But it can be done comprehensively, systematically, with small incremental quanta of dopamine burst. True. Yeah. And here's the thing. First and foremost, get rid of these two words. The, the first word is motivation, mm -hmm. which is anytime you have a word that doesn't have a functional element to it. There's not a lever that you can pull and move. There's not a quantifiable element to it. There's nothing that you can change. Or a box to <clears throat> check off. Or a box to check off or, or a thought to specifically uh, alter. It's disempowering. It really is. So instead of motivation, specific behaviors that I'm going to work with specific measurable behaviors for a given time that we're going to work with. For example, I'm going to get rid of sugar and I'm going to do this for three months. By the way, 21 days doesn't work with sugar or much anything. And, and then I'm going to see how I do. Then I'm going to go to the next behavior. Mm -hmm. The second word is moderation. Moderation is a lazy word that people use and I have used many times in the past where we try to uh, use it to not do things. Mm. I mean, moderation, again, is another word that doesn't have quantity, doesn't have measurable element, and it just lets you slip back to your baseline behavior. Agreed. Oh, it's moderation. I can eat these five pizzas. I can't tell you how many times five I hear that. Five boxes of pizzas I meant, you know. Yeah. 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 Or, or so on and so. So it's, it's, not, it's not powerful. Um, and, and so let's work on habit change in a measurable way. Identify your impediments. Identify your resources. Mm -hmm. If you can't exercise in a gym, which many, not many people can, mm -hmm. you got to get more dressed up than a nightclub. <laughs> Actually, most people should have a core set of exercises, both leg exercises and uh, bodybuilding exercises and aerobic exercises in their room, in their living space. True. If nothing else, while you're watching news, especially if it's bad news, do steps. <laughs> get yourself tired. Do little mini squats with the couch behind you. So even if you fall back, you fall on the couch. Right. Make, and we have dumbbells in the living room. We have these bands. And so make, bring the resources that it can be made easy and the impediments are taken away. So true. Identifying the aligned behaviors mm -hmm. and aligned people, people that are into the behavior change. Yes. The community that we are talking about. Uh, all of that is extremely important. And mm -hmm. most importantly, make it a process. Don't make it a contrived outside thing where boxes of food are brought into your home, which are fine for a period of time, but realize that's not, none of them are able to do it for a long term. Make it part of your life. That's why Aisha in Neuro Academy teaches people how to cook. The act of learning to cook one meal a week teaches you about the food, teaches you about the food types, mm. teaches you how to, some basic techniques, teaches you the value of food. Agreed. Yeah. Teaches you how to take, get rid of salt and instead of it, replace it with um, uh, herbs and spices, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how to address the textures that you're used to. All of that, one act, bring it into your life. Uh, if you're overwhelmed with organizing for healthy eating, batch cooking or batch preparing. Yeah. In three hours, you'll be more prepared than what you've done now all your life. So true. So, so that's true. important. So it's time to identify the automatic behaviors mm. and replace them with the bad automatic behaviors, the habits, with good automatic behaviors. Right. Start with a few. In fact, start with one in each of these areas. The neuro that we talk about, nutrition, exercise, unwind, which is stress management, uh, uh, a restorative sleep, and optimizing mental activity. Mm -hmm. One food that you 
that you will add. Yeah, we always say just add <clears throat> greens. Greens. If you don't want to chew it, just make a smoothie. Yes. Or just wilt it in, in any other regular food that you are already eating. Or, for, ex uh, for example, in exercise, you say just take a five-minute morning walk because that <clears throat> sets your circadian rhythm. You get your melatonin and your cortisol and your adrenaline in line. And it's such a beautiful way to start physical activity during the day. And for the same goes for stress management, for sleep, and for optimizing cognitive activity as well. It's amazing. So just, just start with those. Small and, steps. And by the way, have a sheet of paper next to your couch for each of those, for N, for E, for E. And then when you do your morning walk, check it off. It's not arbitrary. It's not minimalistic. It's so important that check off is the dopamine surge. It's... It's the little tug. Imagine those tugs adding up. Yeah. It's going to change mm -hmm. the direction of that ocean liner of emotion. It's beautiful. <laughs> Your baseline direction will become joy and happiness as you do more and more and more of these tugs. Yeah. That's the critical factor. Beautiful. That was terrific, Dean. And I'm really glad that we took a deep dive into this beautiful talk that you actually give in, in different communities. Obviously, this was a very summarized version of each of the elements of the neuro, nutrition, exercise, unwind, restore, and optimize for brain health. But I wanted to take an opportunity to invite our listeners and the audience to uh, check out neuroacademy.com and take a look at what we're offering as a very comprehensive community that is packed with evidence-based information regarding brain health, and also offering different courses. We have the NeuroPlan course, but we're coming up with the Neuro Coaching and the Nutrition course, which includes cooking, something that I'm really passionate about, and more courses that are related to uh, neurology and neuroscience. Anxiety, which is already ready to go in a few months. ADD, ADHD, traumatic Headache brain injury, headaches and migraines, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis. I don't want to give out the whole list, no, but no. You know, all the information is available at the website. So please go ahead and check neuroacademy.com and we'll make sure that we put the information in the show notes so that you could be connected with us. And you'll be you'll be seeing us on a regular basis. We do live Q&As. We have live cooking sessions and the community members are amazing. Oh, and, We're just and, and conversations with the incredible experts where you and, and the community will have the ability to ask questions uh, from. That's right. We will do live Q&As with brilliant minds in the field of neuroscience and medicine and technology who will bring you the latest and the greatest evidence-based information um, at the convenience of your home. You're just going to be watching on the computer these wonderful people and you'll be able to interact with them. All right. This was amazing. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you. And we will see you guys soon.